Again, we would be hearing a lot of noise from them as well if uh, there had been a predator around. So we're going to head back towards the northwest. Uh, maybe Shadow decided to come back from Sibambili to visit us. Now, it's very interesting. Normally, they pair off sort of in December. But because of the lack of rain, they haven't. But now they have, and you can see them feeding off all the grass seeds. And they might have babies after all this year, just quite late in the season. Now, so it's very common to just see two together at the moment because they are a breeding pair and when the dry season comes they start forming large flocks and obviously ecstatic with the the flush and all the grass seeds around so you're making short work of that digitarial finger grass that they're feeding off they're called finger grass because it looks like fingers you can see it there and they'll be feeding off a host of different grass species. There we go. Let's leave the little pair carry on and we're going to do the same. Very, very difficult to tell the difference between the sexes. Let's see if we can get a little bit closer maybe before we head on. Feeling a bit shy. Okay, so let's carry on. Uh, we're going to head towards uh, Sydney's waterhole in that area. Who knows, maybe we'll find some lion tracks as well. So there's almost zero difference between the the sexes of guinea fowl, so very, very difficult uh, when they're not in hand to see what they are. Uh, they have been domesticated in certain parts of the, the world, and, and there is actually a, a market for guinea fowl meat. Uh, they can be treated very much like chickens and often kept in the same coop as chickens. Now, in rural Tanzania, the young herd boys are out looking after the cattle and goats will often, if they find small guinea fowl chicks, grab them and then rear them so they feed and become very much like a chicken. Now, one of the problems, or not a problem, but what, what does happen with that is quite often they do get a bit of inbreeding in the guinea fowl and you get some very interesting color morphs coming through. So a lot of leucism with, uh, that comes through because it's a, with a genetic mutation and the lack of pigment. So I've seen quite a lot of white guinea fowl don't fly, don't fly. He's going to fly. Oh, he's going to fly. <laughs> there we go. A crested barbet. He was right next to, next to us, but he, he didn't have the nerve to hold his spot before disappearing off. We 
had a question about female leopards, specifically mother and daughter. I'm just trying to remember who it was from. Just give me half a second. It was from Mimi, who's 15 years old. And do mother and daughter leopards fight? Or do they understand that they're mom and daughter? So what happens with leopards is they're a very solitary cat, apart from when they've got young cubs or mating, they will often, so often those territorial boundaries between mother and daughter are quite common. So there will be a vague bit of tolerance, so less likely to sort of plunge into a full fight. So a lot of uh, scent marking, calling, snarling, growling, and we have seen that between Shadow and Karula before. But I think if push came to shove, uh, there would actually be a physical fight and uh, they are defending their now home range and you must remember they probably don't have the same sort of memory as uh, what we do so there will be some form of sort of genetics and genetic code and instinctive response that will try and uh, stop that fighting but uh, I don't think it will hold out specifically as the female or the mother gets older uh, that the daughter might look to extend her territory into the mother's old territory. So there, there are records of females having proper fights, uh, related females having proper fights, and the same would probably go for sisters. So once they are independent and adult, and especially if it's been sort of three or four or even five years since they've been spending a lot of time together, there is a possibility that a mother and daughter will fight. Uh, thanks, Mimi. That's a lovely question continuing on the, the discussion we've been having about how different leopard territories work between males and females. So having a look at poultry, and that's guinea fowl, Clayton's wondering, are there any turkeys in South Africa? And uh, Clayton, there are, but they will be domesticated. So uh, it will be one of the turkey species, I guess, from the US. Uh, so we don't have any indigenous turkey species. Uh, the closest we've got to a turkey would probably be that guinea fowl we just saw. We do have bustards that are quite big, but not quite the same as the turkey. Ostrich, there you go. Liam says uh, the African turkey is an ostrich. And you might think a ground hornbill is like a turkey, but not at all. A uh, completely different family and a completely different uh, way of life uh, and feeding patterns. But a ground hornbill is a similar size to a turkey. Siberia, one of our zoomies said her father actually had a couple of guinea fowl and he used to raise them to try to keep the tick low down so they will eat ticks when they are out in the grassland but they pre definitely prefer grass and Siberia says she's eaten quite a lot of guinea fowl meat. Now I've got a fantastic recipe for guinea fowl and it's quite a common one out here. So what you do is you have a plucked guinea fowl and you put it in a tin foil uh, with a lot of butter and garlic and lemon or whatever herbs and spices you prefer. Now you then wrap it, you can either put it in an oven or on a, in a fire in the coals itself and you cook it for about two hours and after that you take out the guinea fowl, put it in the dustbin and uh, eat the tin foil. Now guinea fowl is quite a tricky meat to cook it needs a lot of time. So generally, in my experience, the best 
way to enjoy a guinea fowls in a casserole and cooked for eight, nine hours. Otherwise, the meat can be very rubbery and tough. So we've got a question from Final Control, from Louise, who wants to know uh, if it's true that guinea fowl can only be caught or eaten at certain times of the year because at other times they carry a parasite. Well, all, pretty much every single bird out here is going to carry a parasite or might, and I don't think it makes a difference what time of the year. But a few years ago there was a a virus that really whacked the guinea fowl populations in South Africa called Newcastle's disease. Uh, very strangely, it affected two species very heavily and very unrelated species. One was the guinea fowl and the other was hyrax or dassies. And those populations plummeted. Since then, it seems like the Newcastle virus has just dissipated and the populations are returning quite quickly and building to be healthy again. Well, Jeffrey in Austin says his family used to raise chickens and they had a few guinea fowls. But Jeffrey had a rare breed of cannibalistic chicken because it killed the guinea fowls and then ate them. Now, I'm not sure why that would have happened. Uh, it could be a competition for food is the most likely explanation for that. But very, very interesting, Jeffrey. I haven't actually heard of that. I know lots of people who raise both successfully without too much violence. So you see, guinea fowl even made it all the way to Texas. Now, another one of our, our African birds, or well, we actually have a few African birds that are now localized in the United States. One is the cattle egret, uh, was brought out in this big misnomer that it was, its, its name was a tick bird. So it was brought out to the, the big cattle ranches to try control ticks. Now, interesting enough, the cattle egret, even though its nickname is a tick bird, doesn't eat ticks at all. Uh, it actually eats other insects and the reason it's found around buffalo and cows and elephants and that is it's actually just feeding off the insects that have been disturbed by uh, by the animals moving through the grassland. So uh, I will show you a picture of it now but there is another bird in Texas that is farmed from Africa and actually there are more of those birds in Texas than there are in the whole of Africa. And I wonder if you can guess which bird that is. Um, if you know the answer to that, drop me an email on questions at wildearth.tv or use uh, the hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. But in the meantime, let's show you what the tick bird looks like, uh, the cattle egret. There we go. That is it in and just find the right place for it there. In breeding plumage. And so I think I actually saw some of them in Florida as well, and that's what it looks like in non-breeding plumage. They get that sort of a rufous coloration when they are in breeding colors. But yeah, highly localized in the United States. I did see them when I was in Florida. They're very, very interesting. And uh, with a lot of invasive and problematic species has all been moved by people. Uh, and here we don't have too many uh, animals that have taken root, but we do have huge problems with certain invade, invasive plant species. Not in the Sabi Sands in particular, but in outlying areas. Well, at least the Ellies are out and about this morning. It doesn't seem to be much else. I mean, we've barely seen an Impala. But 
because maybe Sydney's waterhole is going to change our luck. We're about to arrive. Okay, we're about to peer around the corner. Liam, what do you think we got there? Uh, I'm, I can see a squirrel so far. Uh, Liam can see a squirrel. Uh, I'm hoping maybe for a giraffe. But I think I've got a sneaky suspicion there's going to be nothing. As we peer around the corner, there is waterbuck in the distance. And that is all that is happening at Sydney's at the moment. There we go. A little waterbuck and an adult waterbuck lying on the edge of the water hole. Okay, so we're going to continue our search for other fascinating creatures. While we do that, let's go see what Jamie's up to. Look what we have, speaking about fascinating creatures. A very tiny, very fluffy pavy kudu. And the rest of them appearing through the bushes, or they were peering through the bushes, they've decided that I'm not of any kind of threat. Hello, little one. One of the ones that we've seen born over the last few weeks, not the birth per se, but we've definitely seen them very, very new. Look how much fluffier the calf is compared to mom, including the tail. Presumably for extra insulation, although you'll find that with most young antelope, the youngsters are a bit fluffier than the, than the adults. We'll try get another view, just to try and see if we can't get a clearer one. Oh, little ones looking back at us. We have returned, by the way, to Cheetah Cutline, now checking very carefully for any tracks of Tingana crossing back in. Hopefully bringing Tandy with him as well. Hello ladies. Oh, you are this is a very different different style that we have going on here since the rain. To try and show you animals hiding in the trees. I'm gonna try and find a gap Ooh. <laughs> through the bushes. How's that, Dave? Yeah, that's, cool. that's about as I think as clear as we're going to get see the baby at the back there with very distinctive stripes. Now, watching these kudu, to me one of the most graceful and attractive little antelope, that we can find out here. We've also seen in Yana the slightly smaller cousin of the kudu. Joey was wondering about which antelope species we could find on Juma, including the rare ones. Joey, that's a really nice question. We've actually tried to count them before. I can't remember what the total was, though. I always forget. But what I'll do is we'll go very quickly through my book and we'll talk about, since our kudu have moved off, we'll talk about which antelope species we could see here, starting with the blue wildebeest, which we've seen regularly, that's one. And let's go to the next page. You see, mm, red heart beast, unlikely. So we won't count that one, definitely not seeing Bontebok or Blessbok, they're in the Cape. That's what a Blessbok looks like, by the way, but that's not one we would see here. Okay, next one that we could see and that I have actually seen in the Kruger, a Tsesebe, an extraordinary antelope, the fastest antelope species that we could see out here with the most incredible stamina. You can see with those powerful front shoulders and sloped back, that almost immediately tells you that whatever animal you're looking at, whether it be an antelope or a predator, is built for stamina and speed rather than stealth like, for example, the spotted hyena. What was that? Number two. 
They're unlikely to see the red or the blue dacre. They much prefer the forested areas, but a grey dacre is number three, one that we most definitely could see and do regularly see. Number four. Oof, uh, could we see them on Juma? Probably not because of the lack of rocky outcrops, so we won't count that one, although the clipspringer do occur here. Funny little rock climbing antelope, very... I hope that somebody somewhere is keeping count. An oraby is unlikely. A steenbok, regularly seen. Dave, any idea what number we're on? Five? I think that's four. Four? <laughs> Sorry, you guys can keep count there. I'll just, I'll be in charge of finding you the antelope. <laughs> and the impala, number five-ish, I think. Roan, we could see, and there are in fact specific, or there were in fact specific breeding camps within Kruger in order to rescue these incredibly endangered antelope from extinction. They are now safely back. Could we see them? Yes, we could. Have we seen them? No, we haven't. But we can always keep our, our fingers crossed for a sighting of one. You know what? The elephant herd has come to listen. Let's just have a look quickly. We'll go back to the question. But the elephant herd has come to say hello. They also want a lesson on the antelope species of the area. Hello, Ellie's. Yes, you can come. All right, let's get back to this quickly. Sable, that appeared on the Juma Dam camera for the first time in 17 years, a couple of weeks ago. We didn't get to see him, unfortunately, but he is possibly around. Okay, Hemsbok, no. Buffalo, yes, but that's not an antelope. Kudu are on the list, we've just had a look at them. Sitatunga, we'd be very lost, so no to the Sitatunga. The Anyala and the Bushbuck, both antelope that we could see here. Now there's one that I haven't quite got to that I am desperate to get to because we could see one here and in fact Brent did see one. Elant, the largest antelope of the spiral horned antelope family, so the larger cousin of the Kudu and the Anyala. We could see as well, but unlikely they prefer the sort of more arid areas in the northern parts of Kruger. This is a southern reed buck. Now we could see them here. They prefer the sort of grassland areas. And reed buck, as the name suggests, also enjoy river and sort of high grassland vegetation or reeds, essentially. So that's one that I haven't seen. I'm not sure if anybody's seen them on the live shows. If some of our regular viewers who've been watching for many years could let me know if you've ever seen a southern reed buck. Somehow I doubt it. But I'm not 100% certain, so let me know if you've ever seen a southern reed buck. That is a very rare one that we would get exceptionally excited about, as would be the southern mountain reed buck, also within our range. But again, also not all that likely. So keep your eyes peeled for those. Grey reed buck, unlikely. Water buck, we definitely see plenty of. Lechway, definitely not. Those are in Botswana. Pukus, definitely not. And there we come to the end of the antelope species that we could see in that area. So a very thorough answer. I've lost track. I can't remember exactly how many I went through. Unfortunately, my elephants found my antelope lesson exceptionally boring and have disappeared. That's quite sad. And there you go, that's all of the slope that you could expect to see whilst on safari with us. There is one missing from that list and I don't know how I missed the page in my book. There is one missing that I didn't talk about and let's see if you can guess which one it is that I'm thinking of. It is the smallest antelope that we could see in this region. The smallest antelope, very similar in shape and size to a Steenbok and a Dacre. I wonder what that could be, Dave, do you know? I think it might. Mm -hmm. I saw one recently in a Kruger. I know, I've said bushbuck. Something smaller. 
And I have yet to see one on Juma, but they do exist out here. I saw one in Kruger recently. Brent and myself saw one outside early funds, along with a clip springer, by the way. But we actually reported the sighting of this little antelope. Similar in size and shape to a steenbok. Let's see if you can figure out which particular antelope I'm talking about. That's wonderful news. Joshua's son, Jaden, is watching for the first time. Hello, Jaden. Welcome to the Sunrise Safari. I hear that you absolutely love elephants. Me too. And we started off the morning so wonderfully with such a beautiful elephant sighting. Now, just to let you know why I can't get any closer to these guys, we're sitting right on our eastern boundary. And so I am not allowed to drive on that particular part of the land. But nevertheless, a, a pleasure and a privilege to see them. And we've had lots of elephants this morning on our sunrise safari. So welcome, Jaden. I hope you stay with us and keep watching. Every day, time to see, time to see the one which is where I was born and grew up, where my parents still live city I know very well. Last view of our elephants. Just looking at the one in the back there before they move off and we do too. Okay. Just hidden and dark grey shapes melting into the bush. Isn't it amazing how a couple of tons of animal can disappear not, not even 50 meters away from us. That's how thick and dense this vegetation has got since the rain. And it's so wonderful it's grazing again. It's been a long time since we've seen them actively feed the past. So hey, I'm just causing a bit of a traffic jam here. I'm just gonna let them go past. So I saw where Shadow had crossed in. Uh, but, or crossed out, sorry, should I say, into Sibambili. So we're gonna move on. We're gonna go see what's happening around in Pala Plains and that area, see if we can find anything there. We do apologize for the gremlins with Jamie at the moment. I wonder how long that poor man was sitting behind us while I was looking for tracks. track going across the road here. There we go. And I always stop to check to see if it's a drag mark. In this case, it's a rock monitor crossing the road. So we have a few answers to the bird quiz. And Jeffrey says grey heron. Jeffrey, that is an Excellent answer, and there are quite a lot of grey herons in the United States, except they are indigenous to the United States. It is one of the bird species that occurs on most of the major continents, so through Europe, Africa, the States. I'm not 100% sure about the East or Australia, but they are naturally occurring in the States, but that's a very good answer. It is one bird species we have in both places. 
Uh, Ellen says wild turkeys. I'm afraid uh, we don't have any wild turkeys indigenous to Africa. So the wild turkeys in Texas are probably bigger and better than everywhere else in America, but they are still Texan. So we'll give you a little bit longer, see if anyone else can come up with the correct answer. So, well done to Judy and Shannon who have got it spot on. There are more ostriches in Texas than there are in Africa. Uh, they are farmed there for their meat, a very healthy option, uh, very little fat on their meat. So there are many ostriches in the great state of Texas. So let's go have a look what's happening on Impala Road, Impala Plains. It looks like, unfortunately, Ishada has departed. But I think we're going to go try and find you some birdies this morning. Let's do a bit of bird watching. It is quite a nice cool morning, so we should get some interesting birds. Hopefully one or two that can be added to your bird lists. I know there's some seriously impressive bird lists out there, well over 200. So let's keep it going. So as far as I'm aware, Mike in Florida is top of the pops. I know he's got, I think, around 230 or 240 different bird species seen on the live drives. Wouldn't it be fantastic if I could also add a new bird to my bird list? And that doesn't happen too often in this part of the world. Well, we, we're chatting about cooking wild fowls like guinea fowl and X Ranga says his tip uh, to get them soft and succulent is uh, to soak them in brine overnight before cooking. Well, not a bird but very beautiful indeed. The anthericum flowers. Not too much to say about them. There's no real Let's jump across to Jamie. She's got something very interesting. Oh, there's only one bird of prey that sits up like that with such a fluffy head. You see that upright, really upright posture. And that is a brown snake eagle. And it is a brown snake eagle that has made all of the squirrels in the vicinity absolutely furious because of its presence. I can hear them cackling away. I'm going to follow Renius's techniques. I don't know, Renius speaks squirrel. Renius, of course, being the master tracker that came to give us some lessons. To me, that squirrel alarm call sounds very similar to any other squirrel alarm call I have ever heard. A little bit difficult to identify the difference. Maybe a bit more frantic. Snake eagle, not bothered at all, but surveying the area below him with keen, keen eyesight. Birds have far better eyesight in a lot of respects than humans do. Particularly for raptors, their binocular vision 
which makes sense because if you're going to come plummeting out of the sky in order to catch a snake or something similar, you definitely want to be able to judge that distance as well as possible. Uh, this bird sits without any feathers on his legs. That's another adaptation to his hunting method. As you know, true eagles do not or have feathers all the way down to their feet, whereas a snake eagle has bald legs. And the theory behind that is that it allows him to, or her, to watch exactly and make sure that their legs land exactly where they mean to, whilst dodging the strikes of a snake trying to defend itself. That's what makes them such specialized snake hunters. So a very agile bird. That scroll is still furious. Not only do birds have the exceptional eyesight in that respect in order to be able to determine distance and sort of three-dimensional proprioception, but also, oh, <laughs> that was very brave. I couldn't even see what bird species, I think those were helmet shrikes that attempted to dive bomb that eagle there. They are now sitting, if we just have a look, in the thorn tree, if we go down to the left a little bit. Here we go, that tree that's just come into frame now. Where'd they go? Here they are, fluttering about. It's the white crested helmet. Oh, he's up. There's another scroll alarm calling. Well done, Dave. Excellent. Now we've got some answers to our antelope quiz. Vancey has said the reedbok, which was apparently seen on Encoro recently. I think I said reedbok before, although you are right, that is one that we would get very excited about seeing. Uh, Peggy and Chris Rogue have mentioned the dictic. It's not the one that we could see here. A dictic is a tiny little antelope, absolutely. You are correct, but if we have a look I've got my page open on the answer, so you can't see that right now. <laughs> Where's the dictic? -dic? Just have a look at the dictic's -dic home range. You do get some of them in South Africa, but so the map is not 100% accurate, but definitely an animal adapted for a, a more arid area. So their main population is around Namibia. So a little Damara Dictic, and I know that um, Scott spoke about them at great length. He, he once found himself in possession of one, which is a very entertaining story, but unfortunately I don't know the details well enough to relate it, but that's what a Dictic looks like. So a good answer in that it was the little antelope species, but I'm thinking more about a little antelope that we could see here, the smallest antelope we could see here. And one that we haven't seen, as far as I know, but that we could. I'm going to find the answer again. Put it down. Yeah, we There we go. Well done to Joey and Raisa and James, all saying the correct answer. A Sharps Chreisbok. A funny, tiny little creature. Now, this, this drawing doesn't fully give the impression of just how mottled they look. They look like a steen book that's aged and gone sort of salt and pepper gray with age. Those, that white along their fur comes through very, very clearly. So it looks very similar in size and shape to a steen book, but a slightly more rounded, curved back, even more so. Than a steerbook. There is another Chreisbok species, which is why the best answer was Sharp's Chreisbok, and that's the Cape Chreisbok, although I think one that has wandered along to here would be very lost indeed, and perhaps in need of a map, because they belong, as the name suggests, in the southwestern portion of our country. Well done, guys. The Sharp's Chreisbok. I can promise you now, 
if either Brent or myself ever come across them or any of the guides and presenters, you are going to be seeing a great deal of excitement from us. We will be jumping up and down in happiness. to Anna. Anna was wondering what the difference is between an antelope and a gazelle. And the answer is Anna, gazelles are a type of antelope. So they fall within, antelopes are divided into, we call them families colloquially, it's actually tribes. So the small horned antelope is a tribe, the dakers or the, the small antelopes being part of the same tribe and so on. Gazelles, Thompson gazelles, etc., form part of the part of their own tribe, very closely related to something like a springbok. But we don't we don't have any gazelle species in South Africa. Thompson's gazelles, of course, being the sort of East African, Tanzania, Kenya side. It's essentially almost this is a bizarre comparison, but it's the first one that popped into my head. It is like comparing, or it's like the difference between frogs and toads. Toads are part of, are a family within the frog sort of overarching connective title. So that's the way, <laughs> I don't know why all of a sudden I'm comparing frogs to antelope, but I assume that you, you get the general gist of things. It's like those IQ questions about all mumples or wimples, but so only some wimples or mumbles or whatever it is. You know, the, you get the idea of what I mean. At least I hope you do, because otherwise that entire sentence made absolutely no sense. <coughs> Hello. Warm welcome to Lisa, who is watching in Minnesota. And Lisa has joined us for the very first time and is loving the live stream and enjoying all of the different animals that the reserve has to offer her. But Lisa wants to know, do we ever get jaguars in this area? And the answer, Lisa, is no, we don't. We don't get jaguars, although we get the very close relative to them, the leopard. Now, leopards, in terms of body structure, are slightly small and not quite as stocky as a jaguar. Jaguars are pretty much isolated to the, the, the South American areas. I know that that one jaguar was seen further north in the US as well. I can't remember his name now. I know one of the viewers kindly sent me that, that article on the, the jaguar that was seen further north of its usual range. And I know he was spotted in Texas. But no, unless you're in a zoo, Lisa, you won't be seeing a jaguar but you will be you could well see their closest relative or one of their closest relatives which is a leopard now we've got two big members of that family the lion and the leopard falling part of the panthera family cheapers did you see that <laughs> an ox picker panicked <laughs> And he flew into my head. <laughs> Sorry, that's the first time that's ever happened to me. I promise you I turned my head and it was, it was this close to my nose. <laughs> that is definitely a first. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm really glad I'm not afraid of birds. <laughs> That's never ever happened to me before. <laughs> I wonder who got more of a fright, the ox picker or me? <laughs> That's a new one. That was so close, I promise you he turned here, right next to my head. I had a very good view of the underside of their tail, by the way, as he banked up and over my head. Oh, that was hilarious. Sorry, I, I completely ignored the fact that there's an entire herd of impala that just dashed across the road. <laughs> ah, it was El Jefe, the jaguar. 
Thank you very much, ladies, and final control, providing me with that answer. El Jefe, the Jaguar that was seen in Texas. Hopefully there's more than that. You know, I'm not sure exactly how it works with Jaguars, but leopards, they, their close relative leopards are extraordinary in their ability to move about undetected. And a good example of that was one that was living in the Ellis Park Stadium in Johannesburg for many years, as well as in an abandoned block of flats in Pretoria. So, despite the fact that we think our cities are sterilized of wildlife, even in the largest cities of South Africa, there are still leopards. And in fact, there's a strong suspicion that the leopards move about fairly regularly, particularly in an area known as Randburg or around there, as well as a bit further to the Machalisberg mountain range. And it's thought that the, the leopards do often regularly move down from the mountains and into the cities. There was, of course, speaking about Randburg, um, there was, of course, the famous story of the brown hyena that wandered into Blegari and was photographed wandering down the road. Now, uh, you must understand that for city dwellers in Johannesburg, this comes as quite the surprise, until a research organization chimed in and said, guys, that family of hyenas, there are multiple families of brown hyenas living in Johannesburg, and in fact, one of them dens in one of the largest motorway junctions in Joburg, and in fact, probably in South Africa, an area known as the Galulis Interchange. They were denning there for many, many years until the roadworks actually caused them to relocate. So, might not just be one Jaguar wandering through Texas, you never know. And then, of course, there's always those mystery sightings of the big cats in the UK. The last one I heard about was a stuffed toy tiger that was hidden in a park. Luckily, animal control was straight on the scene, ready to respond with their dart guns, only to realize it was one of those giant stuffed tigers. Uh, that's always the possibility. There's also the big cat that has been seen in Cambridge many times. Close eye on us. The Impala this morning came closest to causing me serious injury by running away and dislodging the ox pickers that were sitting and feeding on their backs and eating the food. I wonder what would have happened if that bird had collided with my head. I wish you could have seen it. It must have looked hilarious. The two of us got such a fright at each other at the same moment. I really thought he was going to fly into my head. I think that probably would have been highly entertaining for you all. <laughs> Trauma. <laughs> oh, goodness. I'm not going to forget that for a very long time. It's the last time I approach Impala with a feeling of complete con <laughs> confidence. Now, speaking about birds and the fact that, thank goodness, I'm not afraid of them, Monkey Man was wondering what my favorite bird is in the sands. Oh, goodness me, that's a difficult question. What is my favorite bird? I really like the little owl species. I really enjoy the scops owls and the pearl spotted owls, even the barred owlets whenever we do get to see them. And I don't quite want I think it's just their, their constantly indignant expression amuses me no end. I love the way they look at you, you've done them some service. Um, what else do I like? The little brightly colored sunbirds I think are absolutely stunning. I've got very used to, I, I guess I take for granted the rollers and the kingfishers. Pygmy kingfishers I do really enjoy. Would it be a Sharps Facebook? Probably not, but we'll just stop and say hello to it anyway. It is not a Sharps Facebook, it is a Steenbock. But you never know. Might would have been highly appropriate if we'd spent the morning talking about it, and it had been. Is that oh, there goes number two. <laughs> and off they dash together. Living and foraging together in monogamous pairs, which is why you so often see both of them together. Although I have to confess, that one that dashed across the road, I think, was a youngster living with its mom. It looked a bit tinier. The one that stayed looking at us was a female, an adult female. Females don't have horns. The males do have tiny little dagger-like horns. I've never seen a steenbok or a male steenbok fight, but I do feel as though it would be very interesting to witness. I can imagine that they would 
baby. Oh, how cute. I've got to stop here. It's going to, oh, it's running away. It was a little baby, Steenburg. No, no, it's fine. It just dashed off so quickly. Okie dokie. Guys, we're going to go quite fast through this area just because my signal's breaking up, but Brent is busy tracking on foot. So we're going to go very rapidly that way where we did have good signal this morning. We're not far. Oopsie daisy. We'll dodge the steer monkey. up to an area where we had perfect signal this morning with the elephants. There we go, that's a bit better. Right, before I got distracted by our little steerbook, we were talking about favorite birds. And I was just saying that I think I've started taking kingfishers and rollers for granted, even though they are so incredibly attractive. Oh look, and it's our elephant herd again. better than an elephant themed sunrise safari except maybe an elephant themed sunset safari hello guys some young bulls straggling at the back of this herd he's about to get across with me just that slight weariness, that slight turn of the head that he displayed. I think that they've been scuffling this morning. He's also secreting from his temporal glands. Now, young males like this, as the same with the females, it's usually a sign of some kind of heightened emotion, whether it's anxiety or happiness or playfulness. Maybe some play got a little bit too rough. Let's just sit nice and quietly. There's another one that's going to come right up to us. Hello, girls. How's it? I'm just going to sit here nicely. Hello, you. Hello, little boy. Oh, so many balls. Straggling at the back. Hello, gorgeous. You're going to be a big boy when you're older. Still very young, haven't got the rounded forehead of a mature adult elephant. Just speaking nice and softly. Isn't that a nice sighting? <laughs> As I said, they're, whilst not cross with us, they've just sprinted back behind me and run off down the road. I'm not going to follow them. I think they've had quite a few vehicles passing through this area and they want to be on their own. The young bull particularly showing signs of stress. Let's just carry on. We'll see what other things we bump into. While we do that, Marianne's asked a question about elephant feeding and we spoke this morning at length about the way in which they feed on plant matter and how incredible it is that they get big on that kind of food, on that kind of diet. Marianne was wondering, well, how do they get calories and the proteins that they need and the nutrients that they need? So there's a type of tree in terms of, let's talk about the nitrates first and the proteins. Acacia trees are what, what are known as nitrogen fixers. Now elephants don't need 
And in fact, people actually, to be completely honest, don't need huge amounts of teams in order to function. Lifestyle is. You do need it, though, in your diet. Trees known as nitrogen fixers. Nitrogen fix fix fixers have special bacterial capsules on systems known as rhizomes. Rhizomes play a role in converting the nitri nitrites into soil into usable nitrates that the plants can then utilize as part of their growth and as part of their need because every living organism needs protein to an extent as part of DNA it's part of a lot of um, cell walls etc so they do need it and of course proteins are enzyme or enzymes are proteins you need to be able to cook the plants in living organisms their metabolic processes are catalyzed by enzymes which are first of all they don't have an unending life cycle so they need to be constantly produced now, any organism needs proteins and that's where the elephants get theirs from from eating the plants and from eating plant, plant leaves and tubers vitamins and minerals most of them come from themselves and especially if the trees are fruiting you'll notice the elephants particularly enjoy the marula fruit which has high contents of vitamin C but of course in winter when that's not possible they will practice a process known as geophagy which is when they go and they lick or eat parts of the soil <coughs> that contain the nutrients that the elephants very, elephants very very well adapted at finding the nutrients that they want to utilize same goes for all of our animals now, I'm sure you are as curious as I am as to what a Brent was tracking on foot. I think I know. I think I heard the update on the Game Drive channel. But I think that you should find out directly from him. So, we found some adult male leopard tracks. Now, very interesting as to who it could be. Liam and I have been discussing it at length. And we think it's some Vula just because of where Tingana was seen last night and the tracks seem to be quite aimless so not like a male leopard on patrol so we're going to do another loop around here and see if we can find any more tracks they are from early last night so not the most fresh tracks but still worth having a squiz Mingus Dave is saying, well, is if the jaguar is a relative of the leopard, are there any relatives of the cougar in Africa? Well, relatives is a strong word. They're, they're, they're under the same genus, but they've evolved separately. They probably have uh, a, 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 a single ancestor, but going back millions of years. But I wouldn't call them, they're not very closely related. Uh, and, and as in terms of a cougar or a mountain lion, if you actually had to compare, uh, they also, in terms of behavior, uh, size, etc., are very similar to leopard. Uh, they are, however, I don't think they are panthera, so they do not have that uh, oscillated, sorry, not oscillated, uh, that cartilaginous uh, hyoid bone that enables them to roar. So, uh, jaguars and, and leopards they are related, but sort of on the grand scale of relations uh, is the same as that all people are related. Um, or we are related to chimpanzees and gorillas. It's, 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 we are, but we're, we're not direct, re directly related. So, and in terms of a cougar, cougar is actually far more similar to a leopard uh, in terms of behavior, size and everything than uh, a, a jaguar. Uh, they do share similar traits, jaguar. Now, they do, they're both spotted cats, although the jaguar's markings are slightly different. Jaguar are much bigger than a uh, leopard, and they also are great swimmers, which a leopard is not. And 
A lot of people wonder why a jaguar is so much bigger than a leopard. Surely because of all the large, much larger prey in Africa, it would make more sense uh, for the leopard to be bigger. Well, not the case really, because they've got lions to deal with out here. So you probably find the jaguar has become that size because there is no other real dominant predator to compete with them. So leopards, in terms of their survival strategy, have gone a, a bit smaller, a bit easier to sneak around and, and very solitary to avoid the social cat uh, being lions. So they don't want to get too big and too conspicuous. Whereas the jaguar doesn't have that issue. That's why they've probably got that much bigger than leopards have. And probably the same reason why the mountain lion has stayed a little bit smaller, try and avoid the jaguars, be more fleet of foot. So we're just checking down the power lines here to see if that male leopard didn't pop out here. Maybe we might even check back towards Impala Plains again. Maybe we'll get lucky with some alarm calls. Well, Shannon in Ohio is wondering, would a leopard ever get too old to climb a tree? Well, Shannon, it is possible in theory but generally before they get too old to climb a tree at all, maybe not climb a tree very well, they will generally be killed by other predators, either by lion or hyena or even another leopard. It's very seldom uh, that anything outside of the really big animals like uh, rhino and elephants are probably the only two that will die of old age, but even then they normally die from malnutrition so they're not able to digest or, or feed as well as they would like and uh, well, elephants in some case and rhinos actually uh, when they get that old they quite often die from drowning now that sounds like quite a strange thing so what quite often happens is when they do get to that very old old age they tend to try hang around a water hole or a permanent water source they don't have to move too far to get water and they just get too weak and while they're at the water they pass out, they're unable to get up and, and they drown. Come on Vim, find him Vula, I know he's one of your favorites. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll find him. There we go, if he's here Vim says he will find him. So Michael is saying that pumas, or mountain lions, or cougars, lots of different names for the same thing, are apparently more closely related uh, to the cheetah than uh, the leopard, and I'm not sure why. I, I'm not 100% convinced. I will, I will do some research on that. So. Is that what I think it was? Oh, you see him? No. No, no, that's not a tree now. No, no, in, in this tree? Yeah. In the center. I haven't seen one of those for a while. Let me just, there we, oh, we popped out. Uh, where do you go? Uh, an, a plum colored starling. Very beautiful bird. Let's see if I can find him again for you. Oh, there, he's on the other side of this glory bush. There's a go-away bird in there as well. The quarries are busy fruiting at the moment. Attracting lots of birds. There he is, just below the go-away bird, Vim. So, oh, look at that beautiful coloring, that iridescence. And this is definitely one of the most striking starlings we get here. 
Now that is a male. Where has he popped off to? There he is. So with the guari fruiting, it's attracting lots of different bird species. Now those little guari berries are very tasty. I snack on them from time to time when I find some ripe ones. There we go, look at that. Gorgeous bird. Looking for a ripe guari to eat. And cleaning the beak from the stickiness from this, the fruit. Oh. <laughs> Go away, birds making a fuss at the top, two fighting over their spot. Thought there might be some mouse birds. Well, well the birds have flown off. Let's go have a quick look at the fruit and then we're going to go see what Jamie's got. She has got something fascinating, a big business of fascinating things, or a large business taking the corporate world of the bush by storm. Let's have a look at, ooh, those, 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 those. ooh, let me go forward a bit. They are looking like some, there's some nice ripe ones here. Come on, come on. Now, this one, you can see, I've just squashed it. You can see that juicy, juicy ripe little berry. Now, I don't want to pop the ones before I get to eat them. So you can see, there we go. And it's a, quite an interesting thing that quite a few tree species do. As you can see, they're not all ripening at the same time. So that's to ensure that they can attract birds and other things at different times. So those little three there look quite, oh, so ripe, Vim. Would you like one, Vim? There we go. Mmm. Sweet and succulent. Unfortunately, mmm. Not much flesh. Here we go. And then in the inside, that's what you get. Little pip, so mostly pip, not much, not much else. So now that large corporation that Jamie has will also feed off these fruits, but only the ones that have fallen to the ground. So let's go see what the corporation is up to. This is one of the coolest dwarf mongoose sightings I have ever had. There's at least 15 of them, all <laughs> situated in their termite mounds. This is one of the largest businesses of mongoose I have ever seen. Business, of course, being the proper collective noun. They're just everywhere in this termite mound. Every little hole I look at has a head curiously poking out at us. And it's amazing how much braver they've got while, just while we've been sitting here observing them. Initially, they were just noses and ears poking out. See if you can't, we'll start from a sort of the far edge with that little guy. Let's count together. One, oh, two. <laughs> Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fourteen that we can see, but I'm fairly certain that there's more in there as well. Look at that one stretching out there. Oh, no, stop now. Look how cute they are. So the smallest predator that you could see out here, a family of dwarf mongoose, one of only two sociable species of mongoose on the reserve, the other being the banded that we hardly ever see. And this grouping will be made up of one breeding pair, the alpha female and the alpha male. And the rest of these guys will be committed to, just like with wild dogs, committed to raising 
their babies and their babies alone. Look at them scurrying about. That constant little sense of curiosity and alertness happening. There's a couple of juveniles in this group, almost fully grown. Dwarf mongoos can grow relatively rapidly compared to other animals out here. So it only takes them about six months to reach adulthood. And the alpha female can breed about twice a year. They've probably had a bit of a lion this morning <clears throat> and are only now, just now, coming out and basking in the sun and getting ready to forage. I'm just going to make a slight noise and just let's have a look at their reaction to it. variety of different alarm calls producing different responses that last one that I did was a sort of general bird alarm call you can see how they all didn't panic but just tensed a little bit they've got such a wide vocal range oh something scared them and it wasn't me and once again we're starting with the heads popping out and every now and again very subtly one dashes away from the termite mound and off to go forage. Donovan, I agree, I also love them. They are such sweet little things and highly entertaining to watch. I wish that Get to know the different mongoose groups. I've got a couple of friends who spend their days studying specific different families of dwarf mongoose. So unfortunately, it seems like Jamie's still got a few gremlins. Uh, hopefully they'll be sorted out shortly. We're just doing a big loop around this block where we saw those leopard tracks and trying to see if they come out here. And those are hyena tracks. So there's a strong possibility that he's having a schnooze somewhere in this general vicinity. down here oh, maybe he's got a meal in that block somewhere so one of the things about when there's lots of water around that makes it quite difficult apart from the difficulties of just seeing tracks is uh, the fact that there's so much water so when a leopard has a kill and there's only certain water points they can go to you'll often find the tracks to and from there but at the moment there's just puddles everywhere so they don't have to move to and from the permanent water which can make it a little bit more interesting let's say uh, to find them helps to check in the big marula trees.
So Victoria is spot on. Uh, Puma are, are in their own family, the Puma genus, and then obviously Jaguar, uh, Lion, Leopard, Tiger are all in Panthera, and Cheetah is in Asionix. So that's why I'm finding it difficult to say that a Cheetah is more closely related to a Puma, just because of where they evolved. Now. I didn't say earlier that uh, the puma and leopard were related, I just said they were more similar in behavior. Well, they are related, all the cats are related, they all do come from a common ancestor. But uh, in terms of behavior, uh, uh, size, uh, prey selection, etc., a puma is far more similar to a leopard than it is to a cheetah. And of course, it does have retractable claws. Okay, so we've got no tracks coming out. This is where we were earlier. So he must be hiding in this thick block somewhere. And I think we'll definitely have to come back here on the Sunset Safari to investigate further. in Toronto is wondering how many prey species die of old age as opposed to being hunted. Well, in this part of the world, I would say almost none. Uh, everything is sort of hunted before they get to that age. As they start becoming slower and older, uh, they are generally picked off by the predators before they can sort of pass gracefully into the night. Occasionally, you will find the odd animal that has expired from old age, specifically around the lodges and will normally be in a nyala or a bushbuck. And even then, it's not from old age itself. Now, the older individuals that have managed to find homes inside the lodges, it's a little bit safer than out in the wilderness. Uh, they will quite often die at the first cold snap of winter. So, just bodies aren't able to cope and they expire when we get that first really cold night. And it happens in areas without big numbers of predators, so game farms that don't have any predators. And uh, you see it with, specifically in Inyala and Bushbuck, and also Zebra. And they can die from the cold as well. Now on our, oh my, family farm that we used to have when I was a kid in KwaZulu-Natal. There, at the first sort of real snap of winter, and it's much colder than here, uh, and we only had, from large predators, we only had leopard. And when that first major cold snap happened, uh, we probably had about a hundred or so zebra on the farm, and every year we'd lose about six or seven of the elder zebra to that cold snap. Thank you very much, Michelle in New Jersey, who's gone and found the big cat family tree. So, cheetah, puma, and the jaguaruni, which is a small cat, all share a common ancestor, where there's the common, the panthera common ancestor, begot. Uh, of course, all the major panthera species, as well as snow and clouded leopard. So, thank you very much for that, Michelle. So yes, cheetah, theoretically, way back when, are far more closely related to the puma than the leopard. The 
we're just double checking that that leopard didn't jink back towards this area. No one has driven here yet, so if there are any tracks, they should be nice and clear in the road. So it doesn't look like anything's around here. I wonder what the last few minutes of the Sunrise Safari will hold. And I can definitely say it's gonna hold one big black backside. Maybe two big black backsides, three big black backsides. And some buffalo balls. Hello, mister. Having a good head scratch. Itchy. There you go. So you often find branches broken like that, and a lot of people often incorrectly assume that it is from an elephant. And there you can see buffalo are quite adept at doing a bit of tree destruction themselves. Now it's got a bit warmer, and these buffalo are moving from the warm ground on top of the crest going to try find a nice wallow or pan to sleep in for the day and uh, ruminate. There we go. Hello, mister. Oh, we got a little family of ox peckers on that buffalo. You can see the juvenile hasn't quite got the red beak yet. Uh, these buffalo are on the march and I'm pretty sure I know where they're going. There's a lovely little pan just up ahead. It's okay old man, let's not have a major panic. Oh, to you too. <laughs> so we're talking about uh, that guinea fowl recipe and I mentioned the throwing the bird in the dustbin. Uh, Deborah in Minnesota would like to know what a dustbin is. Well, um, in, if you're in the UK or England or or the old British colonies, a dustbin is a trash can. Uh, so that's what we call a trash can out here. So, <laughs> sorry about that. I must remember to use both uh, the North American and uh, British sayings for certain words. Otherwise, we can cause a little confusion. Andy and Julie in Los Angeles say, is there an equivalent to the Bigfoot myth in South Africa? Well, not quite the Bigfoot, um, but there is the myth of the Tokolosh, who is a water sprite. Uh, he is very, very short, but he has a very long um, appendage and he wraps around his waist and uh, it's said to live in sort of low-lying swampy areas and to be quite naughty and, and commit murders and that, except they have a great love of children and will never harm a children. But further north in Africa, there's a, a very similar uh, story to that, but I'll have to go into that a bit more detail on the Sunset Safari, if you guys remind me. It's called Kulikamba. So that is said to be a cross. Oh, there's a little Eastern Red-Footed Kestrel. Oh, he's going very quickly. Oh, he disappeared. 
Um, but there we go. Thanks for joining us on the Sunrise Safari. Unfortunately, Jamie's still got gremlins, so I'm going to bid you adieu for her and for Dangerous Dave. But don't forget to join us for another riveting sunset safari as we go in search of all Africa's wonders. So from VM and myself, goodbye. <laughs>